to God. Glory to God. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Bless your name. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord. We bless your name today. Truly, you're great, sovereign, holy, majestic. You are the rock upon which we stand. Oh, we magnify you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. We honor you, King Jesus. I magnify you, Lord. You are great. You are sovereign. You are holy. You are marvelous. You are majestic. You are supreme. You are, Father God, I everything. Lord, this evening I come before you just saying thank you for another opportunity, O oh God, to share your word. I pray today, Father God, that your word will inspire, will edify, will build up, will encourage the people of God to empower the weak, to cause the poor to become rich in you, that our ears will be open to hear your voice, our eyes to see beyond the natural realm into the spirit realm, the kingdom of God, to see you in the fullness of who you are. Lord, you're great and marvelous. I thank you for making a way out of no way, for Father, for how you keep on providing for us, oh God, in spite of the hardships, the difficulties, the frustrating moments, the challenges, the test, the sicknesses, the diseases, oh God, that attach itself to our immune systems. When our minds are in confusion, yet God, you're still great. And I thank you, Lord God, as we put our confidence and our trust in you, that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. 
I lift up, Father God, my mother and father this evening. I just decree healing, strength, restoration, wholeness, soundness, all over their minds, their bodies, and their spirits, oh God, that it would respond to the word of God and be healed. Many others, Father God, who are suffering with any type of illness, any type of sickness, any type of infirmity, there is power in the name of Jesus. And I call on your name tonight, God, just saying thank you. That your blood still work, oh God. And I plead the blood of Jesus right now, God, over every person, Father God, who's operating in a demonic activity, who's being controlled by seducing spirits, who's being controlled by Jezebel spirits, who's been falling after lie and delusions, whose hearts have been broken and hurt. Those who've been bound up and tangled, oh God, in the snares of the enemy. I bind it now, God, back to the pit of hell where it come from. I loose the word of God that has the power, the ability to break the shackles and the chains, the strong men, the strongholds off the mind of your people, that they will be set free. I thank you, Lord God that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And because you allowed us to go through trials and tests, temptations, disappointments, discouragements, heaviness, bitterness, Father, all these different things are the attributes of the flesh. But yet, God, you allow these things to happen to us that the enemy afflicts us with, God, to turn our hearts towards you. And I'm asking you tonight, God, that you give us your heart. Give us your heart that we will seek after, that we will hunger and thirst after your righteousness that only you can satisfy. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. Lord God, make my tongue the pen of a ready writer let the word engraved on my heart be revealed to the listeners of God to redirect their steps. If some are walking in a crooked path, the crooked place will be made straight. Some who's walking in rough places will be made smooth. Those who lifted in pride will be brought low and the humble will be exalted. And I thank you, Lord God, that we have ears to hear. Let us hear what the Spirit says to the church. That our lives will be changed, our hearts will be transformed, our minds will be changed to be like you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, hallelujah, amen. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. Bless your name, God. Hallelujah. Bless you, bless you. Good to see you, Vic. God bless you, my brother. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, as we've been studying the last few weeks, we've been discussing the spirit of haughtiness. And as we come to the conclusion that haughtiness is a spirit of pride. And pride has its what has its it has its reason in many different areas of our lives. There's a righteous pride and there's a selfish pride. The righteous pride is when we turn our focus and begin to magnify the Lord, to glorify Him in everything in our lives for what He's done and what He continues to keep doing. But that selfish pride 
is we leave God out the equation. We do whatever we want to do to satisfy and appease our flesh, which causes us to sin against God. But tonight we're going to start a new discussion, which is dealing with the spirit of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness. Heaviness is defined in the dictionary as the quality of having great weight. The quality of having great weight. Another word for heaviness is burdens. And we all know about burdens. Just like when you take a yoke of oxen and you plow in the field, you put that heavy burden on the on the oxen to plow the fields for you in order to make a straight path to plant your seed. But then there's a burden of problems, there's burdens of pain, burdens of sickness. And the enemy wants us to be imprisoned by this burden of heaviness because he knows if I can get you in a place of despair and misery and sorrow I can turn your heart from having faith in God to where you magnify focus on and dwell on your condition and your situations instead of seeking the face of God I want to read today's devotional it says, Father, today I'm so grateful. Let me turn this music off. This is going to annoy me. But let me, uh, give me one second here. There we go. Let's see. I just stopped this thing. Bless the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. There we go. That's better. Okay. Our devotion today. It says, Father, today I'm so grateful for this beautiful day you have made thank you lord for this opportunity to see another day i know tomorrow is not guaranteed but i'm here now and i'm excited lord you woke me up this morning with the breath of life you made me out of your own image you breathe into my lungs you breathe into adam's nostrils to give him life just as you gave him life, I have life. Each and every breath I take is only because of your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. I welcome this day, yes, a brand new day, a day for more hope for my future. Yes, another day to work on living my life with the purpose and the plan you mandated, Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, Father, I will enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. It's a beautiful day. I know everything is just going to get better and better. With you, Lord Jesus, I have the victory. Every precious day you give me is amazing with having more of you, God. I, I love this devotional because it is reminding us that even when it looks like it's a bad day, it's still a good day because the Lord made the day. Not only did he make the day, but he breathed life into you again to get up to see another day. There are many people who have not got up this morning. Many people passed away in their sleep. Many people lost their lives in automobile accidents. Many people been murdered and shot by guns and died. But we have another opportunity to see another day. And because we have this opportunity, tomorrow's not guaranteed because the, the Bible tells tomorrow you know, is, is not promised to us. But today, it says to live today with a purpose to magnify the Lord. And I guarantee when you submit to God's authority and you give him the charge to have control of your day, everything that got purpose for you is going to work out just fine. 
a day for more hope of my future. God has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a future for you tonight. And God wants you to know tonight that in his plan is success, is prosperity, is, is, is enjoyment of life, is satisfaction, receiving his promises, everything that God has spoken to you prophetically through his word, God says is yes and amen. So therefore, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So tonight we're going to engage in our lesson, the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3 is our key scripture. Isaiah chapter 61 is our key, verse 3 is our key scripture. And it says, I'm going to start at verse 1, Isaiah chapter 61. And it's talking about Jesus Christ. Isaiah was appointed to be a prophet to proclaim the word of God to Israel to let them know of the coming Messiah. And because he was appointed to, to uh, declare the word of God, he, he starts out saying in verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Isaiah is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he knew that the Messiah, the deliverer of the, the uh, oh God, help me Holy Ghost tonight. He knew that the good shepherd was going to come and redeem God's people from captivity. So he referred in, in the scripture here to the coming Messiah. Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to appoint to them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness the planting of the lord that he might be glorified you see isaiah was making a declaration to let us know that the purpose of the messiah to come he was going to be filled with the spirit of god not only was he going to be filled with the spirit of god but he was going to be anointed to preach good news that same anointing that was in Jesus Christ is the same anointing that rests upon you today, my brother and sister. And it's up to you to get into God's word to learn how to operate and use this anointing. A lot of people who claim to be anointed is not anointed. Because if you're not operating according to the word of God, where the spirit of God is, is ministering to you and using you to, to inspire, to edify, and build up the people of God, to preach the good news of the gospel, to set people free. You're not operating in anointing. You're operating in your feelings. Your feelings is a difference from the anointing. Because a lot of people operate under the feelings and call themselves praying for people and declaring the word of God over people, speaking prophetically over people. Really, they're speaking from their own intellect. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to have a prophetic word spoken over you that does not uh, have, put it this way, that have not been spoken to you already. Any prophecy that God speaks into his people is confirmation of something God already spoke to you. And God confirms it through the prophet from the word of God. And it's up to you to get in the word of God and allow the word of God to minister to your heart. Begin to meditate on the word of God. Begin to mutter the word of God. Would you speak the word of God to yourself? Begin to seek God's face. Consecrate. Get into the place of prayer and fasting. Because when you get into that deep consecration, things begin to shift in your life. Demonic forces will come harder against you because of the anointing. But God had Isaiah speak this word. He sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim that the captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, is the one who has brought us the anointing and gave us the power to operate in the anointing because he said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. Luke chapter 19, 10, 19, chapter 10, verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And he says that he sent him. He's talking about Jesus. And you know, check this out. The same overcoming power that rested inside of Jesus. The same power that caused the blind man to see. The same power that caused the cripple to walk. The same power that healed the boy that had seizures. The same power that caused the dead to be risen. <coughs> it's the same power that rests upon you. In our book tonight, The Spirit of Heaviness, it says the symptoms, the, the symptoms of this strong man include, as the text suggests, excessive mourning, which is grieving, sorrow and grief and depression. Excessive mourning means a heaviness, a strong desire of grief to where it produces sorrow depression, despair, hopelessness, self-pity, loneliness, disappointments, insomnia, inner hurts, and bruises. The spirit of heaviness tries to take our joy of living by loading us down with heaviness, depression, weights, any weights that's weighing you down is a burden. Just like when we go into the gym and you go in there and you find the type or the excessiveness of weights that you're able to operate to build yourself up or you can lift and strengthen yourself with. But if you get too much weight and you try to lift that weight that weight gonna fall on you, just like when you take the bar, the uh, barbell, and you put those weights on there, and you try to lift it, and that weight gets too heavy. What happens? It falls. And if you're lying down bench pressing, and you try to lift the weight that you're not able, haven't been trained to do or properly lift, that's what I'm looking for. Properly lift, that weight gonna fall on you and pin you down to that bench. The enemy does the same thing. He bombards you with excessive weights, excessive depression, excessive despair, excessive hopelessness, because he wants to take away your dependency upon God, because he knows that God has the power, he has the ability to lift that weight off of you, but he wants you to be blinded from the fact that God is working in your life. He knows God is working, but do you know God is working? Think about it. God is working in us every day of our lives to do what? Perfect the thing that concerns us. In other words, to bring out the best of his ability in us. And God is working to bring you to a place where your total reliance is upon him and not in yourself. The problem comes in the reason why many people are clinically depressed, physically, physically depressed, spiritually depressed is because of the mindset have turned from focusing on God and turned to dwell on yourself. The more I magnify my problems, the more I magnify or gratify or puff up my sorrows, my hurts, my pains, my bruises. You may have been in a broken relationship and you got your heart broke. That's, that's, that's disappointing. That's discouraging. 
And then only that, it takes away your trust factor for the next individual God has for your life until you heal. You may have many people go from one relationship to the next, hurt people hurting people because they've been hurt, so they hurt somebody else in the relationship. When God is trying to heal the broken heart, he said here that he has sent me to comfort the broken heart and proclaim that the captives will be released. Until we recognize the spirit is operating in my heart, I will never see myself coming out of the hurt. I'll never see myself coming out of the pain. I will never see my heart being healed. I will never see God binding the, the brokenness in my life because I'm focused on myself. Myself is deceiving. Myself is prone to do evil. Myself will allow me to slip into the places where God brought me from so I can find myself gratifying my flesh again, which leads me down a pathway of sorrow and destruction. But then he says, he sent me to set the prisoners free. Many people in God's kingdom are still bound in the house of God. You haven't tapped into the kingdom principles. You don't know the kingdom authority. You don't know the kingdom word. In other words, the kingdom language. So you operate according to your feelings, facts, and emotions. And everything the flesh wants you to do, which you find yourself falling suit to, which pulls you from the truth of God's word. So the enemy wants to take away your joy by loading you down, bombarding you, causing your cart to be flooded or your heart to be flooded with all types of burdens. And when he put those things in you, many people find themselves committing spiritual suicide and physical suicide. Spiritual suicide is when you turn yourself over to the voices of the enemy and you totally reject God. You hear God speaking, but you turn a deaf ear to God's voice. So you find yourself dying spiritually to the things of God and starting to live to the fullness of the worldly things, which is not of God. So the enemy knows he attempts to move in when we are mourning and to keep us in this abnormal state of perpetual grief, continual grief. The enemy knows if I can get you in a place of mourning. Mourning is a sorrowful time. We all experience that one way or another in our lives with the loss of a loved one or someone dear to us or a friend. And that spirit of grieving is a normal response of the human nature. It is normal and it's healthy to have periods of mourning after the loss of loved ones or even a, or even a favorite possession, a job position, pets, boy or girl, girlfriend. Whenever we lose something that we, we highly value, it takes time to adjust both physically and psychologically. It takes time to get past the grief. Many people who are bound in sorrow, they, they take a long time to come out of that sorrow. You have people that have been grieving over 25 years of the loss of a mother or the loss of a father or the loss of a child or the loss of a friend. When God wants to heal that brokenness and use it as an instrument to build you up as a testimony to help someone else get through their tough time of grieving, we get stuck. We get stuck right there in that place. Whenever we lose something we highly value, it takes time both physically and psychologically to the vacuum the results. But we do not mourn indefinitely. Grief is, God, is a God-given emotion that allows us to empty out the deep feelings 
that we that must not be kept inside. But grief, if long continued, can become a neurotic return to immaturity. And therefore it is destructive. When you find yourself stuck in the mindset of grief, it can lead you back to an immature mentality. Everything becomes petty. Everything becomes childish. Everyone is at fault around you. You never see yourself at fault, but everybody else, you want to blame everybody else for the reason why you feel the way you do. We allow the comforter, we must allow the comforter to heal the hurts and carry away our grief. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows and he nailed it to the cross. We must release it to the Lord and go on with our life the best we can. And the only way to do that is to recognize I have the spirit of heaviness. I have this problem inside of me. I'm hurting. I've been wounded. I've been bruised because of this loss or this heaviness or this weight upon me. But God has the ability to take away the burdens on your shoulder, to remove the yokes on your neck. He tells us in this word, weeping endures for a night. In other words, there's a dark season in our lives where we're going to be grieving. But joy comes in the morning. M-O-U-R-N. I-N-G. Joy comes in your morning period. God doesn't want you to stay bound to the grief of that state of mind of sorrow. But he wants to deliver you and bring you out where you can be a living testimony. I've known people who have lost loved ones and never gotten over it. So 25 years later, they're still mourning the anniversary of the death as, as though it just happened. As a result, all kinds of negative things takes place in their lives. The remaining living members of the family resent taking second place to the dead person. Ooh, that's deep. Check this out. Because people are bound to that state of mind of mourning, your family members or your friends, people close to you, don't even want to be around you. Because you gratify the death of that person above God, above everything in your life, above every person in your life, to where you run everybody away from you. When all the time, the problem is not the people, the problem is you. So the physical health, health of those involved is affected. And a spirit of fear usually moves in somewhere along the line. So what the enemy does, if I can get you to stay entrapped in your mentality of sorrow, of heaviness, the spirit of fear, fear is false evidence appearing real. The spirit of fear will affect you and cause everything that you once trusted in, now you don't trust nobody, you don't trust no place to go, so you find yourself bound up in your house and you stuck there because you're afraid to come out of your comfort zone. When death is magnified, it creates fear. How many times can we recount the details of someone died without being affected by the whole process, especially if it was excessively violent or morbid. God's people do not concentrate on their attention, their attention on the death, but on Christ, who is the life. You know, this is a very good point. When people die in our lives, we call it in the body of Christ. A home going celebration. In the worldly arena, they call it a funeral. Why? Because the funeral is putting away the dead and people are sorrowful. But as believers, when that person was a born again believer and they died, we already know the confidence 
that they are in the presence of the Lord. Paul puts it like this, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. I press towards the prize. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. First of all, sure enough, they died. But I'm not going to dwell on the death anymore. I'm going to forget that thing. Then I'm going to reach for it for the prize. What prize? Of knowing that my eternal security, that if anything happened to me, I have a high calling which brings me to the eternal presence of my Savior to live forever. That's an assurance. That's a guarantee. Isaiah assures us that God wants to turn our ashes or our death experiences into something beautiful. He does that when we put on the garment of praise and apply the oil of joy to our aching hearts. The reason he says here, he sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it the day of his anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give them a crown of beauty for ashes and a joyous blessing instead of mourning. That is exciting. That's, that's excellent news. To know God gives us a crown of beauty in place of ashes. The ashes is the dead. When your body decay, ashes to ashes, death to death. It goes back to the ground. But God says through Isaiah the prophet that God would turn our ashes or our death experience and give us a crown of beauty. He does this when we put on the garment of praise. So when you put on a garment of praise, it's when you finally reach that eternal destination before the presence of the Lord and you apply the oil of joy to your aching heart when you get into God's presence. Even today, we can have a God experience with the oil of joy because even though heaviness comes in our lives, we don't have to stay there. We can get into God's word, start finding scriptures on, on praise and worship, excitement, and begin to magnify God. And when I magnify God, he takes that heaviness off of my shoulders. He embraces me in his love. And he lets me know, child, I got you. Everything going to be all right. I know what you're going through. I know how you're feeling. I know what's hurting you. I know what's wounded you. I know what bruised you. I know the slanders. I know the pains. I know the disgusting moments. I know the things that you've done. But you know what? Those things doesn't matter anymore. Because I took all that stuff, I put it in my son Jesus when he put it on the cross. He knows you made mistakes. He knows you came up short of his glory. God bless you, sis. He knows everything about you that when you started getting to that place of this, this, this despair, that place where you feel a regret, the place where you felt like all hell was breaking loose in your life and, and people come reminding you of the things you've done in your past. God knew about all that. So he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to turn your, your mourning into to, to dancing. Why? I'm going to give you a garment of praise in place of heaviness. Give you the oil of joy to cover your aching heart. Why? Because he loves us so much. Because he loves us. The devil is a lie. He cannot steal your joy unless you give him your joy. We know that death isn't a happy experience for anyone. But to the believer who views it from the perspective of God's word, it's, it can still make a positive contribution to our growth process in God. God's word gives us the encouragement to know that in the process, of everything we're going through in our lives that's grieving or that's hurting us, that's wounding us, that's causing us misery. He knows everything the enemy brings against you has no influence over you unless you give him the power. He said we must put on the garment of praise 
by thanking God for the time he gave us with our loved ones here on earth. So even though you lost a loved one, even though you lost your job, even though you lost your friends, even though you lost your family, God says it doesn't matter what you lost in the process of the losing. God said you're going to gain in the end. He says he'll take your sorrow, turn into joy, your mourning into dancing, give you a garment of praise for heaven and build you up upon your most holy faith to trust him all the more. Why? Because he loves you unconditionally. God said what the enemy meant for your harm. I'm going to turn it around and call it working out for your good. The slanders, the persecutions, the trials, the struggles, the disappointments, the heartaches, everything that's been going on in your life, self-pity, depression, heart conditions, brokenness, God says everything the enemy brings against you, even through natural causes, God says, I am still Jehovah God. I am the Lord God that healeth thee. He will continue to touch your body. Why? Because he touched your mind. God always works on the mind in order to work on the heart. Because he knows if I can get your attention through your mind, through the psyche, I can get your heart and bring you to the place where you receive the word of God with meekness that's able to save your soul. Until we get into God's word, God's word will not operate in your life. Overcoming the spirit of heaviness. <clears throat> Satan is also called the adversary. He opposes us in our walk with God. He uses many tricks and devices. One of his tactics is to send a spirit of heaviness upon us. When we recognize this spirit, we are able to overcome him easily. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the methods, the cunnings, the crafts of the devil, the deceptions of the devil. Spirit, the word spirit is ruach. This is the same word used for spiritual life and beings, including God. It is used also of breath and air, and it does not mean feelings or attitude. The Spirit of God, the Ruach, the breath of God, it was breathed inside of us the moment we came and began to accept Him as our Savior. The Ruach, the breath of God, began to breathe life into you when you were spiritually dead, separated, alienated from Him. God says, I knew your condition. I know where you were before you came to Christ, but after receiving Christ, he said, I breathe into you the breath of life, and the breath of life made you a living soul in the spirit. People who are still walking without Christ in their lives, they have the spirit of heaven upon their hearts. They are still dead men walking. Why? Because the breath of God is not in them. The breath of God only comes into a people who recognizes that I needed the Lord in my life. I needed the Savior to come into my heart. I need the word of God to bring me alive. And God spoke a word and said, I command you to live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. God said, Ruach came unto you the moment you said, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. This does not mean, this is not man's own spirit, but which is called the spirit of man. So, the spirit of man is not your spirit. The spirit of man is God's spirit inside of you. This is not, not God's spirit, nor can it be from God. It is a demonic spirit. The, the spirit of heaviness is a demonic spirit, which is not from God. Heaviness, it means somewhat dark or darkish, or wax dim, smoking, heaviness, dim, dull, colorless, to be dark, to be faint. The effect of a plague darkening the skin, the dimness of the eyes in old age, a fire gone, gone out of the flax or reed is still smoking but not extinguished. 
a heavy spirit. Heaven has come in many different forms. It can be, like I said, discoloration of the skin. It can be when your eyes going dim. When you're sleepy. Let's say you're taking a long journey on the road and you get sleepy. Also, your eyes get heavy. And you, you, you begin to fall asleep behind the wheel. Why? Because heaviness came upon you from being weary from the long journey that you're taking. And the enemy knows if I can keep you in a place of heaviness, I can entrap you in a spiritual prison. That's when the strong man comes into your heart. The subject we've been dealing with for the last six months is the strong man. The strong man, the spirit of heaviness, the strong man will come and deceive you to make you think what you're doing is of God when all the time is of yourself. If God is not in the equation of anything you're doing and you call, call it God, you're walking in deception. You're falling at the line. Because the enemy will deceive you to make you think everything you do that, that is God doing it. Even in trouble. Oh, God called this trouble in my life. Even in heaven, God put this heaven on me to teach me a lesson. I heard so many different cliches growing up which is all lies and, and, and uh, manipulation from the enemy through people to get you to a place of entrapment, a spiritual entrapment to make you think that God will afflict you with illnesses. God will afflict you with problems. God will afflict you with burdens to get your attention. That's a, that's a lie from the devil because Jesus said, I came that you would have life <coughs> excuse me, and have life more abundantly. There's no way in the word when Jesus came, he said, I afflict you with heaviness so you can have life. No, he didn't say that. He said, I, he didn't tell you, I'm going to cause your enemy to turn against you so I can give you life. No, he didn't say that. He said, you're going to have enemies come against you because of the life. And you got to get a revelation to get an understanding of what I'm talking about. Because when God gives you a revelation, he enlightens you to begin to see what he's talking about. The effects of a spirit of heaviness. The, the, the effects of heaviness. The spirit of heaviness. It darkens our countenance. Our hearts are downcast. The spirit brings heaviness over us. It dims our vision. It robs us of our hope. The room may actually look darker. You, you know, have you ever been in a place where you just got bad news after bad news after bad news? The more bad news you got, the more miserable you became. All of a sudden, the room around you begins to get dark. And you start turning down the lights and make the lights dim. You really know some people get in the dark room. They just sit in the dark room. Don't want no light. Why? Because the spirit of heaviness has overpowered them. And when that spirit does that, it's the enemy dimming you from seeing what God sees in the midst of your situation. He don't want you to get into the place where you receive God's word. He doesn't want you to get in a place where you receive deliverance. He doesn't want you to get into the place where you receive healing, victory, overcoming joy. He doesn't want you to get into that place where God rescues you. He wants you to see nothing but gloom and doom. The spirit of heaviness, it brings a heavy, oppressive feeling. Just like when people were in slavery, they were oppressed. The enemy will oppress you. He will oppress you with heaviness. He will oppress you with sorrow. He will oppress you through people. He will oppress you through negative conversations. You have been in a place where you were so full of joy and excitement, just sharing the good news and just, just tell, talking about Jesus until somebody come along with a gloomy spirit. And all of a sudden you go home and all of a sudden you got this, this misery overpowering you and you wonder, like, where did that come from? I was just full of excitement. I was just talking about the Lord. I was just telling people about Jesus. And all of a sudden now, because this person came with some, some negative news and some, some stuff that they done heard or stuff they done gossip about it, and they just bombarded me with this mess, now all of a sudden now I'm feeling oppressed. The enemy wants to oppress you. He wants to put you in a place of imprisonment. So when he gets you there... He steals your joy. He steals your contentment. He takes away your peace. He takes away your excitement. And all of a sudden, now you have this dark cloud. You're just miserable. So the oppressiveness of the enemy 
It brings oppressive feelings. It quenches our faith. The enemy wants to quench your faith. Because he knows if I can stop you, I can get you in a place of self-pity. Self-pity is selfish motives. That's where it comes from. Because the more I dwell on self, I magnify self. Then I begin, begin to resent myself. Why God let this stuff happen? Why God allow these people to treat me the way they do? Why God allow people to slander me? Why people God allow people to talk about me? Why God allow this, 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 this to happen to me when he loved me? So the enemy wants to bombard your, your mind with all this garbage. So you become a, a, dump, a garbage dump filled up with a bunch of negative mess that you never thought about before. Also, now your mind is bombarded with so much negativity, it overpowers you. Now you're a garbage truck, carrying garbage where you go. So even at church, I try to go to church, try to get in the mood of the service, but because I've been carrying all this garbage in my garbage truck, I ain't let it go. So I'm dragging the garbage truck all around, and I'm keeping the garbage to myself. So I go to church, call the altar call, but I still ain't dumped the garbage. So I go to the altar call. The pastor prays for me, anoints with oil, but yet I'm still holding on to the garbage. What purpose does it make to keep carrying the garbage? When God says, cast your cares upon me because I care about you. If you recognize that spirit of heaviness that come upon your heart, you got to be willing to lay it down at the altar. It may come over many at once. It's like a plague. It may be a cloud hanging over a place. It causes us to isolate. It steals our love and makes us feel alone. The spirit of heaviness, it, come, it can come at one time in one place and hit everybody in the same place. You can have a room full of people and the people are excited, having a good time. And all of a sudden, this bad apple spoiled the whole bunch. Why? Because we, we allowed it to come in, then we accepted what the enemy brought us. Instead of rejecting it, we received it, then it got into our spirit. So all of a sudden, now I'm miserable. Then you find yourself, as I mentioned earlier, getting in a dark room, a place of isolation, don't want to talk to nobody, phone ringing, I'm not answering the phone, I'm not praying. Then all of a sudden, suicide thoughts cross your mind. You try to figure out ways how to end your life. I've been there in that dark place. Try to kill myself because of things of the past. You know, all, all this stuff comes from the mindset. The battlefield of the mind. I love that book by Joyce Myers because that book set me free. When I read that book, I even listened to it in audio version. That book got into my spirit and it broke some things in my life. And it showed me that he who the Son has set free is free indeed. And I tell you, when God did this, he broke the shackles and the chains off my mind. Where now it's like, who cares what people think about me? You can talk about me all you want to. You can slander me. You can cut me down. You can slice and dice me. You still ain't taking away my joy. Because my joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, the devil didn't give it to me, and he sure can't take it away. That's how you know that you anchored in the Lord when you got such a confidence in God. It doesn't matter what people do to you, you're not going to let nothing separate you from the love of God. When you get into that place of true satisfaction, where you know that the life I live I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me, who died for me. Now the life I live, now in the flesh, I live because he lives in me. And when you know that's your blessed assurance, your hope, that should give you that confidence in the midst of the storms of life to keep on standing. Douglas Miller made a song, My soul has been anchored in the Lord. Though bills may roll, may break it, may dash, I shall not sway because he holds me fast. So dark the days, clouds in the sky, yet I'm keep on holding fast. Why? Because I'm holding on to Jesus. 
And when you hold it on to Jesus, he promises that your soul can be anchored in the deepest wells of sorrow, in the deepest pit of separation, in the deepest struggles and the pains of life. He promises us that we can hold fast to his hand. He will never let us fall. David said, my foot almost slipped into the pit, but the Lord heard me and delivered me. We have to get to that place where we allow God to minister to our hearts, to bring life into a dead thing. God can take your deadening moment, your most pitiful moment, your sorrowful moment, your deepest despair. He can take those things in your life and use it as a tool to build you up in your faith. But you got to trust him. You got to stand on this word. Time, show, get away from you having fun. I'll tell you that. But I want you to stay encouraged tonight, my brothers and sisters. Because tonight, you know, let this word minister to you. Let God's word minister to your heart. God is here. He's, 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 he's bringing life unto you to restore you, to empower you, to encourage you, to keep standing on his word and allow the Holy Ghost to wash you clean from darkness, to wash you clean from that spirit of heaviness and allow his presence to embrace you in his love. So Father, tonight we thank you for this word. I pray, oh God, that your word will have an impact in the lives of those who heard this word, oh God, whose spirits have been heavy for quite some time. And they couldn't figure out where it was coming from or because of a loss of a loved one. I pray, Lord, tonight that the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross would mend the broken hearts and bind their wounds to bring restoration. Let there be a revival on the inside tonight, God. That the spirit of heaviness will be broken off their lives, oh God. That your healing balm, your anointing salve, the same anointing that rests upon our Savior, the anointed one, will flow from heart to heart to strengthen, to encourage, to edify, to build up your people, to restore their hope, to give them joy in a place of sorrow, to give them true satisfaction that's found in knowing you and to know God that our souls are anchored in the Lord. Father, we bind every demonic force, every negative foul spirit that were trying to come attack us because of this word, God. We send it back to the pit of hell where it comes from. And I loose the power of God to stop the enemy in his tracks, his negative mindset, his destruction, his foul spirit that would try to attach itself to the minds of your people, God. That you would set them free tonight, oh God. They would remain free, stay free, walk in freedom, and abide in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know our Lord and Savior tonight, I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need the Savior. And I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. And to wash me clean in the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you, Lord God, for forgiving me. As your word says, you love me. And you gave your son for me, God. I receive him as my Lord and Savior. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. And that with the power of the anointing to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer tonight, welcome to the family of God. The whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner who turned their lives over to the Lord tonight. We're going to continue this on next week, the spirit of heaviness. Share this with your friends and loved ones. And know that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you choose to sow a donation into the ministry, I put the post on, on the earlier in my announcement. you find the links for those different entities to sow. And I pray that God bless you. Stay encouraged. 
stay excited about Jesus and know that you don't have to be victimized anymore by the spirit of heaviness. Because after hearing this word, God's word is going to orchestrate your pathway because he said the steps of a good man, they are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. So God is going to take pleasure in you tonight because you heard this word, received this word, and this word will manifest in your life. God bless you until next week and shalom. Peace be unto you. Hallelujah.